body and Glenn is out the second. Okay, we'll start with this. It appears unbeaten up-and-comer, former GB member, Chloe Watson, is going to be participating on Sky Sports and Boxers' April 2nd card. The card headlined by Savania Marshall against Femke Hermans. Chloe Watson, an unbeaten up-and-comer, a flyweight. A damn good one. She will be making an appearance in Newcastle. I had a look at this fighter, and I gotta tell you, I was really impressed. I mean, I really was. She's only got one recorded professional fight, one pro fight. This will be her second, but she seems to have everything it takes to make a splash, a very big splash, in today's flyweight division. Anywhere at or around flyweight. Chloe's very bouncy. Very fast. Fast hands and fast feet. Fluid in and out game. Fluid combinations. The work is very tidy. It's not slappy. It's not scrappy. It's very neat and easy to appreciate. The variety of punches. Punches to the head. Punches to the body. The snap on that lead hand. The snap on that jab. It's a short jab. It's not a long stiff stick. It's a, it's a short jab she doubles up and sometimes triples up on. It's a short punch. A very short punch. It's a setup punch that allows her to step into range and set up other shots while while the other girl's guns are holstered, while the other girl is covering up. There's a lot to admire in Chloe Watson's work. There is obvious in and out game there. I want to say that Chloe Watson, in spite of just having one pro fight, one professional contest, one professional bout, she has the look of a boxer puncher that likes to apply pressure, not to be confused with an according to Hoyle pressure fighter. She's not one of those. She's not limited to being just one of those. She's no come forward mauler, plotter. She's got very good feet, this kid. Bouncy. She can double up, triple up on that jab, step into it and unleash combinations, or she can bounce out of range, catch the other girl coming forward. Catch it with a counter shot. I want to say that Chloe Watson's amateur pedigree really shines through and how neat and tidy her work is. It's not... This kid's got serious ability. She's only 22 years old. Chloe Louise Watson is someone you want to keep an eye on anywhere at or around flyweight, the flyweight division where there are four active reigning world champions, Japan's Onoko Fujioka, who holds the WBA, the USA's Marlene Esparza, who holds the WBC, Argentina's Leonela Paula Judica holds the IBF, and her countrywoman Deborah Ana E. Lopez, she's got the WBO, Argentina's got two ponies in that flyweight show. Two champions, two unbeaten ones. Leonela Yudica is the longest reigning champion among them. An unbeaten up-and-comer like Chloe Watson, a blue-chip prospect, is a credible threat to the reign of every single one of these active reigning champions. You heard that right. When the time comes, when Chloe Watson is ready, given all the ability she's already showing at just 1-0, and oh, just 1-0, and oh, she's going to be a serious threat to these champions. Set to return on the undercard of Marshall versus Hermans. That's going down April 2nd, April 9th. Two of the four champions at this weight are going to be locking horns. On the undercard of Ryan Garcia versus Emmanuel Togo, America's own Marlene Esparza is going to be taking on Japan's own long-reigning champion. Naoko Fujioka. An excellent fight. One of the very best fights this division has to offer, if I do say so myself. It has all the ingredients to be a difficult fight for Marlon Esparza, who's a seasoned boxer, comes from a great amateur background, so she's not a big puncher. Over time, she hasn't proven to be a concussive puncher, the kind of puncher that could perhaps get some respect from Naoko Fujioka. Naoko, who I give the edge in power ahead of this fight, I think Naoko is the stronger puncher of the two. And she might be 46 years old, but I think she's got the better gas tank also. Noko Fujioka is an experienced pressure fighter, the kind of mid-range to inside puncher that has to keep punches coming from the opening bell to the final bell, whereas Marlon Esparza, seasoned amateur that she might be, now a defending champion, a reigning champion in the pros, she's shown that she fades down the stretch. She guesses. Noko Fujioka!
Fujioka is ranked on the women's ring IQ pound for pound list in the number five spot. Should Marlena Spoza beat her, she will be integrated into the ring IQ pound for pound list. Marlena Spoza has already unseated one long reigning champion in Ibeth Zamora Silva for what was the WBC title at this weight. If she collects Naoko Fujioka's WBA title, per the rules that govern the list, and defeating a pound for pound fighter, she will become one herself, a unified champion that has unseated two long reigning champions in the flyweight division. Yeah, that's if she beats her. Stylistically, it's a bad style matchup it is, on paper. It's a bad style matchup for a finesse fighting kind of fighter that ain't a big puncher and don't have the best gas tank like Marlon Esparza. But the air of spontaneity associated with this fight is that Naoko Fujioka is 46 years old. She's an aging fighter, an aging champion. And at any moment, age could catch up to her. She's only fought once in the last, I don't know, two, three years. And that was last year when she won that majority decision over Sulem Urbina. Yeah, she's fought in the last 12 months, but we haven't seen her since then. And where Naoko Fujioka has only fought once, just once in the last something like two or three years, Marlene Esparza, she's been busy. She fought three times just last year, just last year. She's staying sharp. Stylistically, you have to give the edge to Naoko Fujioka. You may have to give her the edge in power and stamina, endurance as well. And she certainly is the more experienced fighter of the two fighters in the fight. Naoko Fujioka is a four division champion after all. There's some things that are working for Naoko Fujioka ahead of this fight, ahead of this unification match, but time, time isn't one of them. She's an aging fighter, an aging champion. Marlene Esparza may not be as experienced or as hard to punch it, but Marlene, unlike Naoko, Marlene is in her prime. Just some things to think about ahead of this April 9th showdown, this April 9th unification match set to go down on the undercard of Garcia versus to go. We'll talk more about this fight as the fight date approaches. In heavyweight news, reigning unified heavyweight champion Oleksandr Yusik has indicated that the Anthony Joshua rematch is in doubt as he defends Ukraine from Vladimir Putin's invasion by Russia. I really don't know when I'm going to be stepping back in the ring. My country and my pride are more important to me than a belt. Well, I just told you this rematch was in jeopardy two days ago. I told you. In spite of Eddie Hearn's optimistic talk and reassurances that the rematch could go through, I didn't see it that way. War don't come with a sell-by date. This could go on for months, maybe even years. Well, I hope it doesn't, but I have to be objective. I have to be realistic. Alexander Yusik was asked if he's willing to take a life to defend Ukraine from Russia. If somebody's going to take my life away, or my people who are close to me, I will have no choice. I don't want to kill anybody. But if it's going to be my life on the line, I'll do it. And I told you, this is a life or death situation. Just because the bombs aren't going off in your neighborhood doesn't change the reality of the situation. The reality of the situation for those Ukrainians. The reality of the situation for Oleksandr Yusik. Right. This division's reigning heavyweight champion. There are more important things going on. More important matters than boxing matches and scheduled... Contracts and scheduled rematches. He's got people to take care of. I've questioned the extent the degree of Oleksandr Yusik's involvement in this war. Is he held up on a rooftop throwing Molotov cocktails at tanks, or is he in a bunker somewhere? In any event, neither scenario, he's got people to take care of. That's why he's there. And he's going to prioritize those people over any contractual obligations. The question now is, if Usyk is otherwise preoccupied with this war for the immediate and near future, how are the alphabets going to react to that? I don't think here and now the sanctioning bodies, the alphabet organizations, are going to strip a guy who willfully walked into a war-torn country. That would reflect poorly on them. And for what it's worth, the alphabets, for the most part, are standing with the Ukraine in lieu of this invasion. I don't see them stripping Oleksandr Yusik in the near future, but those titles can't be left in limbo forever. If this war drags on for months, does that mean those alphabet titles are going to be all tied up for months? What you have to ask yourself is, how long will it take for the alphabet organizations, those sanctioning bodies, to act if this war drags on until the end of the year? God forbid. What are they going to do? For the time being, it's becoming more and more clear that Anthony Joshua may have to find someone else to fight in either May or June because there's no telling when this crisis is going to be over. War don't come with a sell-by date. It's going to go on for however long it's going to go on and we don't know how long that is. Anthony Joshua can't wait for Usyk to come back. Not if it takes too long. What's he going to do? Hold up his own career waiting for that guy? It's reported that Anthony Joshua has made certain changes to his corner additions 
And, you know, in some circles it was felt that maybe Anthony Joshua shouldn't even go into that Usyk rematch. Some people felt he should skip it to break in his new trainer. That wasn't Anthony Joshua's plan or Eddie Hearn's, but that is how some people felt about it. Now it seems that Anthony Joshua may have to do that because he doesn't have much of a choice. Oleksandr Usyk's not prioritizing his rematch with Anthony Joshua over the current crisis in Ukraine. Of course he isn't. But Anthony Joshua can't hold up his career waiting for that guy, so he might have to get out there in May or June. There's no statute of limitations here. There's no telling how long this war can go on, will go on, and there's no telling what the alphabet organizations, the sanctioning bodies, there's no telling how they're going to react to it. But in the mean and between time, Anthony Joshua is still young. He's still in his prime, and... He has to ask himself, how long should he wait before he moves on? He doesn't have to move on now, not straight away, but how long should he wait before he dies? That's the question. This could be a blessing in disguise for him, as strange and taboo as that might sound. A lot of people didn't like his chances in a rematch. That unfinished business has been put on hold. Well, he can't wait for that guy forever. Anthony Joshua versus Alexander Yusik too isn't even the only fight Not. affected, impacted by this war, per a tweet from Michael Benson. The WBC, IBF, and WBO have now stated that they will no longer certify title fights involving boxers from Russia following Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Appears this may impact Artur Betterby versus Joe Smith Jr., but WBA not involved, so not Canelo Alvarez versus Dimitri Bivol. The WBA took their stance on the situation earlier this week, though yesterday, the WBC, IBF, and WBO jointly took a hardline stance against Russian athletes. Boxing scribe of Canada, Jeff Jeffrey, tweeted, since the WBO, WBC, IBF will not sanction any fight by a Russian or Belarusian fighter, the duel between IBF, WBC champion and Artur Betterbeef and Joe Smith Jr., WBO champion, is on hold until the end of the conflict. It was supposed to take place at the end of June. I told you, Joshua versus Yusuk 2 ain't the only fight that's being affected by this. Those organizations, those sanctioning bodies, they're taking a hardline stance. And I'm not going to get into the ideological and ethical dilemmas associated with this move. I'm not here to talk philosophy. I'm here to talk boxing. It does seem prejudicial, though. A penalty for one based on the actions of another in association with where the fighter hails from. I will say it does seem prejudicial, though, ultimately... I'm not here to talk philosophy, I'm here to talk boxing. The situation is what it is, regardless of what I feel about it. The question now is, where do we go from here? We don't know that this conflict is going to end by June. You think that Putin's going to stop sending troops to the Ukraine so that Artur can have his fight with Joe? You guys hurry up. We hurry up and take over to Ukraine. I want to see this boxing match in June. Yeah, there really are no guarantees this crisis ends by June. plan was for the winner of Smith versus Better Beef to go into a fight with Anthony Yard. The story is that Bob Arum promised his old buddy Frank Warren the winner of that fight would travel to the UK and take on Anthony in Anthony's neck of the woods. That plan might have to be accelerated but not involving Artur Betterbeef. Joe Smith Jr., you know, he's American, and he's a WBO champion. Maybe he goes into that fight with Anthony for the time being, whilst Artur is not allowed to compete. The sanctioning bodies won't sanction any fights for him involving his two alphabet titles. There's not a lot that he can do about that, and that's the situation. But Joe, Joe Smith Jr. doesn't have to let that situation and that crisis hold up his own career. He can travel to the United Kingdom and face Anthony Yard or see about rescheduling the fight he was supposed to have with Callum Johnson. 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 Joe Smith Jr. has that option. Artur Betterbeef doesn't. These sanctions, these restrictions, whatever you want to call them, by way of the alphabets, they have left Artur's career in limbo. Artur, you know, the guy's just having a run of bad luck. I think he's been having a run of bad luck for a long time because his career has often been stifled. He's not even based out of Russia. He's based out of Canada. Well, he is a Russian national living abroad all the same. His Russian descent is the reason that his alphabet titles alphabet organizations they won't sanction any fights for him not so long as this war rages on not so long as this crisis continues and in his career once again it's left in limbo if you know anything about Artur better be you'll know that he's a fighter a champion who in some ways has lost a good amount of time throughout different moments different times 
in his career, the promotional issues that he had with Yvonne Michelle, the contract he tried to get out of all the time he lost on that, the injuries, the COVID-19 pandemic, and now this crisis, this conflict in Ukraine, the Russian invasion. Once again, his career is left in limbo. I don't know that any or many of you out there think it's at all fair for the alphabet organizations to take a hardline stance like this. I don't know how you guys feel about it. I just know that's what's going on. And once again, Artur Better Beef may be set on the sidelines. He's been benched. Once again, he's out of action. Crisis in Ukraine is affecting the entire world. That includes the world of boxing. There is a question as to whether or not Canelo versus Bivol will be a non-title fight should the WBA refuse to sanction the fight because Bivol is Russian. The WBA hasn't taken the hardline stance the other alphabets have. A portion of the article reads, the WBA's public stance on Russia's invasion of Ukraine will not impact the status of the card headlined by Mexico's Alvarez and Russia's Bivol. The WBA, along with the IBF, WBC, and WBO, have jointly announced that those sanctioning organizations will monitor the approval of championship matches involving Russian boxers as long as this unprovoked attack lasts in the Ukraine. But the WBA has left themselves a little bit more wiggle room. Existing champions, full-fledged and regional, their status has not been rescinded. They've been allowed to maintain their status. That's per their own... Per a tweet from the WBA themselves. So if the WBA doesn't sanction Alvarez versus Bivol as a title fight, it would largely defeat the purpose of Alvarez moving back up to the light heavyweight division. Had he known the Russian versus Ukraine war would prohibit the WBA from sanctioning it as a champion match could have required Bivol to move down from 175 pounds to the 168 pound limit to fight for Alvarez's IBF, WBA, WBC, and WBO super middleweight titles and the accompanying payday. Though it's a title at light heavyweight that Canelo Alvarez is after. He's already got all the belts at super middleweight. It's it's Dimitri's WBA title that he wants. The question here is. Is the WBA going to take the same hardline stance? The same hardline stance the other alphabets are taking. They're going to take that stance at their own expense because if they refuse to sanction this fight between Canelo and Dimitri, it's their loss. They're the ones that are going to miss out on those hefty sanctioning fees. That big payday. It's not just a payday for Canelo and Dimitri. It's a payday for them too. And they know that. The hardline stance that WBC, the WBO, and the IBF have taken is a hardline stance it is, but economically, it's a stance they can afford afford to take because their big money makers ain't Russian fighters anyway. If we're being honest. The fiscal repercussions are not identical to, say, prohibiting American fighters from fighting for your titles or, or Mexican fighters. You know, they generate a lot more money for these alphabets than those Russian fighters do. UK fighters do. I don't know that the WBA is going to follow suit on that.